I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this morning to Yale's and fourth annual day of data. We're ha very happy to have everyone here. Um, my name is Jill Parchuk. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Science, Social Science, and Medicine, and I'll be your host for the morning. Um, before we do anything, I want to just give a few little logistics. Um, there will be photos and video being taken throughout the day so that you're aware of that and um, give a little courtesy to the photographers while things are going on. Um, we ask you to silence your cell phones. I know everybody's very important, has a million things going on, but we can turn off the ringers. Um, coffee, you've already seen, I hope, downstairs. Lunch will be in the same location this afternoon, and we'll have some instructions for you at that point about how to uh, line up, queue up to get down to lunch so that we don't have a mob scene. Um, restrooms, there are two restrooms right down the corridor, right near where you came in, and then there are a few more downstairs, if you just go down the stairs and down the hallway and down another set of stairs. The schedule for the day is on the web, but we also had some we handed out at the table as you came in, so if you need a schedule, you can pick one up there. First thing I'd like to say is thank you to all the sponsors for the Day of Data. First off, the Office of the Provost, who has been generous and very supportive in hosting this. Um, the Center for Science and Social Science Information, many staff members who helped to make the day happen. The Center for Teaching and Learning, who is supporting our video um, setup for the day. The Digital Humanities Lab, who also heavily participated in the planning. The Institution for Social and Policy Studies, who's been a great supporter of Day of Data from the beginning and um, did a lot of the planning also. The Yale Institution for Network Science, also big contributors to this event. And Sigma 11 Distinguished Visitor Fund is also a supportive, so we're very grateful for our sponsors. A big thank you also to the planning committee um, for the Day of Data, which has been superbly led by Michelle Hudson. Michelle actually deserves a hand of applause. <laughs> Other members of that committee have been K Kaylee Bohemier, Kathy DeRose, um, Aaron Wachowitz, Melanie Maxson, Tamba Flowers, Paul DeBello, we couldn't have done it without Paul, um, Kate Nyan, Peter Paduzzi, Lamore Peer, and George Strand. So thank you to all of you. Uh, one thing I think you all might like to know is that the Day of Data also holds some follow-up events in the spring. Um, this year, in, li in line with the Day of Data theme of reproducibility, we'll be having a spring re reproducibility workshop that will be conducted by the Center for Open Science, and that'll be held on March 3rd. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, there will also be a series of other smaller um, lectures in the spring, um, and they've been outstanding in the past as well. So um, that information will be sent out to everybody who registered for today. On to our outstanding schedule of speakers. Our first speaker this morning is Steve Gervin, Deputy Provost for Research and Eugene Higgins, Professor of Physics. Um, professor Gervin joined the Yale faculty in 2001 as a professor of physics and in 2007 was named Deputy Provost for Research. His portfolio includes the Central Campus Science Departments, the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and the School of Engineering and Applied Science, as well as various institutes and initiatives. <coughs> Additionally, he collaborates on science strategy with the School of Medicine. His academic research is in the area of theoretical quantum physics. Steve, do you sleep? <laughs> 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 Professor Gervin holds a, a bachelor's degree from Bates College, a master's degree from the University of Maine, and MS and PH degrees from Princeton. In recognition of his research and comp contributions in the field, Professor Gervin has been elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, and the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. In 2007, he was awarded the Oliver E. Buckley Prize of the American Physical Society. Without further ado, Steve Gervin. hooked up to my 
One of my various science studies today is astronomy. <laughs> so, and this is only going to display on that screen, is that right? So, uh, welcome, and uh, welcome to this uh, fabulous uh, new space that you'll be hearing more about uh, as the home of the Yale Center for Research Computing. Second one. Okay. So uh, I don't have to talk to this crowd about the, in this modern era, the the flood of data, the, the deluge of data, the tsunami of data, which is coming into Yale every day from all parts of the world. Uh, you genomics people are the worst offenders. You know who you are. Uh, but here's another source of data that flows into Yale every day. Anybody recognize this? This is the South Pole. We're standing uh, 10,000 feet above sea level. There's 10,000, this is snow on the surface, but below there is 10,000 feet of solid ice, crystal clear. Light can travel through it huge distances. And uh, there are lots and lots of photomultiplier detectors where they melted a hole thousands of feet down, buried them in the ice, and trillions and trillions of neutrinos from uh, the galaxy are passing through every square centimeter of that space every second, and occasionally one of them interacts with the ice and gives off a bit of light. And uh, the entire Antarctic ice shelf is being used as a massive detector, which is then uh, uh, detecting these uh, particles from the sun and from the galaxy and from supernovas. Amazing. Uh, uh, and weird source of data which uh, flows into the university uh, each day. And of course, there are many, many uh, uh, bigger sources than that. Uh, where cryo-electron microscopy is about to start uh, on the West Campus. That'll be um, uh, attempting to catch up with the genomics people, but the genomics people will probably still uh, <laughs> win that race. <laughs> So um, many of you, the locals, will have seen President Salovey's uh, uh, communication to the university 10 days ago uh, about the uh, university priorities and uh, academic investments that will be made over the next 10 to 15 years at Yale. And uh, while there's a bit of something in there for everybody, the far and away the key top priority is going to be science. It's, the, it's the, the area that we need to focus in to uh, compete uh, on the world stage with uh, uh, the other really top universities around the world. And <clears throat> so, of course, uh, our ability to handle data and uh, do great science is going to be a key part of that, and we have to work on the infrastructure needed to do that. You see here, um, a rendering of the new um, multi-hundred million dollar uh, science building, primarily devoted to biology. It's uh, in place of the uh, Gibbs uh, building, which doesn't look as nice as this. <laughs> and uh, the, there will be um, uh, space for cryo-electron -elect microscopy, optical microscopy, um, uh, all kinds of biology labs, physics and astronomy labs, all of which are going to be producing more and more data. So, uh, and data, of course, ties in with uh, Yale fulfilling its mission. Mission: we, we are an institution that take our mission to do good in the world uh, very seriously. Um, we're trying to improve the world through education, research, practice, clinical practice, um, 
educate leaders, and <coughs> um, free exchange of ideas is absolutely a uh, core principle, and there uh, that is now including data. So um, in exchange for uh, uh, the opportunity to um, do research and uh, fulfill Yale's mission. People have uh, academic freedom to choose the topics that they work on, but have some responsibilities to steward the scholarly record, to provide access to the knowledge that they're uh, generating, and um, of course, responsible for making sure that it's reproducible and for allowing other people to check the reproducibility of that data. And that's, um, in this day and age, a super important uh, uh, topic. It gets complicated when you think about the sort of traditional, the tradition of keeping your raw data. I hate to keep picking on the genomics people, but it's just becoming a physical impossibility in some cases, and you have to decide what, what, what are the standards of the field going to be uh, in terms of registering data and what fraction of the, what version of the non-raw data, et cetera, et cetera. So some complicated uh, questions as the ethos in different subfields evolves. There are a lot of demands and expectations uh, from um, uh, many sources. Uh, the government uh, is here to help us and, or was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's been a, uh, there's been a uh, requirement for about nine years now that clinical trials uh, uh, should be, in the results, summaries of the results should be available to the public, and uh, they should be registered before you start and the results summarized when you're done. That enforcement has uh, not been uh, strong, but starting January 18th, it's going to be very strong, and we have to be um, prepared and have systems in place to, uh, with the institutional review boards, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that that happens. Uh, everybody knows that OSTP has been uh, promulgating policies about um, uh, open access to data, uh, so have the journals, and um, there's various reproducibility initiatives which are exposing potential weaknesses in certain areas of certain fields of research, and uh, I think it's very important that we um, support those, and uh, if we lose the trust of the public because our results are not reproducible or uh, uh, appear to have been influenced in some way inappropriately. It's just all over for science. So we absolutely have to um, uh, support those initiatives. So <coughs> we've been thinking about this here and uh, I've been getting a lot of help from uh, Lamore Peer who's sitting over here and who helped organize this event. Uh, thank you, Lamour. Uh, thinking about uh, policies and guidelines, uh, services and centers that, that Yale has now or should have now, and education and training, um, not just for the young people, but uh, also for um, faculty who are uh, beginning to uh, <laughs> see the tsunami uh, data coming towards them. So uh, Lamore has been chairing the Research Data Policy Committee, and we've been trying to think about <coughs> uh, as part of the kind of uh, infrastructure for supporting data and data science at Yale and sharing of data. We need not just physical infrastructure, but policies in place. And uh, we're, we're going to be in the coming months uh, on a little road shows to various departments and divisions around the university talking about uh, that work that's been going on, which includes uh, uh, some uh, sort of little white papers that will talk about uh, principles that we should keep in mind as we develop further policies, as we build our infrastructure, 
uh, and hardware and um, consulting services and all those things. Also new at the university is a data governance committee, which is primarily focused on Yale's internal administrative data, um, uh, classroom occupancy, uh, uh, registrar data, uh, financial data, all, all kinds of things like that, um, who, you know, to clarify who has access to what, how much is public, uh, uh, just all kinds of policy questions um, that, uh, and, and attempts to define very precisely where is the, uh, the uh, primary record kept and please don't keep uh, inaccurate copies of that. Keep a link to that primary one, and, and uh, <laughs> we'll be able to function more efficiently, we hope. So it's primarily about administration. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of services and centers already in existence, a research data consultation group. Uh, on the, this side of town, uh, there's a stat lab in the uh, CSSI that uh, uh, Jill can tell you about uh, in the Institute ISPS, ISPS Institution for Social and Policy Studies. This is the other half of uh, Lemoore's life. Uh, they're uh, uh, pretty serious about um, keeping uh, uh, records that have been, uh, can still be accessed and understood uh, <laughs> after you've written them. Uh, you'll hear more, I think, from Harlan Krumholz today. Uh, he's been involved with this uh, project in the med school, and there's uh, for uh, clinical trials and, and uh, big data things in the med school, there's this uh, data coordinating center. So there are many uh, uh, places around campus where education and training in data science are, uh, exist or are coming into existence. Um, we have a, uh, a two and a half year old Yale Institute for Network Science, which is um, bringing together people interested in networks, social networks, gene regulation networks, um, Ethernet networks, every possible thing you can imagine. The, the, probably the most heterogeneous group of people that are willing to talk to each other on campus, and it's because they can all come and learn, if they don't know it already, the language of mathematics for describing uh, networks. And of course, uh, uh, big data is uh, part of that. Uh, it will, uh, assuming it is approved by the uh, corporation in uh, this coming week, there will be a data science initiative uh, announced uh, involving, uh, uh, in the FAS, involving the Department of Statistics, Computer Science, uh, other um, mathematics departments. Uh, uh, on campus and uh, was recently announced a Yale Center for Biomedical Data Science. And one of my jobs is to get these two uh, coordinated and talking to each other. Um, the Digital Humanities Lab uh, is another place where our humanist friends can uh, come and learn about um, uh, numbers and other in inhuman objects. Uh, the Stat Lab, the, this uh, Yale Center for Research Computing, you'll hear much more about uh, in the next talk from uh, Kieran. And uh, there are a lot of uh, data hackathons uh, going on, both uh, from the organized from the top down and, and a lot from uh, like uh, Hack Yale from the bottom up, just students getting together and uh, uh, having an <laughs> an event with thousands of people from around the world um, showing up to spend a weekend working on data. So uh, this is intended to not be readable, but just to illustrate the uh, scale of things that we e either have or need to have in the, in the coming future in order to manage the whole data life cycle and for those parts of it, the research that are externally funded, they're kind of the pre-award, award, and post-award parts. And some of these things uh, uh, are in place. Many more need to be worked on. 
and um, so we have a we have a big challenge ahead of us, and we'll be coming to talk to the uh, Yale folks uh, in this room about how we can make the build the appropriate um, services, infrastructure, policies, procedures to um, deal with. Uh, this flood of data, which is uh, such an essential part of research today. So thank you very much. <laughs>